Hello, um, my name's Arthur Brandwood and welcome to this September 2017 uh, live webinar. Today we're going to have a look at where it's all at in Australia. The title is What's Up Down Under? Um, regulations and Reimbursement. Australia has been subject to all of the inquiries and reforms that are going on all around the world and we're going to take a closer look at where it's actually at in, uh, in the reform processes uh, with TGA and with medical device funding. Before I begin, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. You should be able to see a, a small control panel with a, a little um, uh, orange arrow if it's minimized. Um, you can open up that control panel and at any time um, place a question into the into the box marked um, questions for staff um, and uh, we'll see those questions as we go through and at the end of the webinar um, I will do um, a question and answer session. Let's begin. Um, firstly, I just want to um, take a quick refresher um, of current TGA processes. Australia has a risk managed uh, regulatory review process where um, just as it is in Europe, just as in other markets, um, the regulations um, are applied according to device risk and um, we have a classification scheme just like Europe, um, basically copied exactly from the European classification scheme with a couple of small changes where we've added in active implantable medical devices as being equivalent to class 3 and we've got separate classifications for IVDs, um, very similar to what's now being done in Europe. Australia implemented that uh, four-tier IVD classification system some time ago. Um, but it's a risk-based regulatory process and here's how you get to register devices in Australia. For class one, it's a simple notification by electronic um, filing and e-business system, the little e-logo there, and um, class one devices notified um, to TGA are able to be supplied um, the following day. The approval comes in overnight. Um, for higher risk devices, for, for um, uh, class one measuring and, and sterile and 2A and 2B, most devices are actually brought in based on a CE mark. TGA recognizes the CE mark as, a, as an alternative to it doing its own conformity assessment. And if you have a CE certificate, um, then for a large number of devices, you can simply present that CE certificate to TGA and then register devices within the scope of that certificate. And that process works very quickly. For a small subset of those, the TGA may do what's called an, app, an application audit. It's not required, it's non-mandatory as it's called for, for these low to medium risk devices, but TGA may during the application process um, call for um, data and the application audit is a desktop review um, of your CE certification and declaration of conformity, but also looks at the risk assessment, the clinical evidence report and the labeling and instructions for use. And TGA can then call on any other data they wish to, to see if they decide to drill down further, but normally it looks at those high level documents. If we look at um, some higher risk devices, the class three AIMDs and certain um, specified class 2B devices, which are listed here, the barrier contraceptives, apart from condoms, disinfectant devices, intraocular lenses, and non-saline uh, breast prostheses. Um, those groups of devices, um, the application audit is mandatory. Um, TGA will call in the, the, uh, the high level data on those um, and they charge a fee for that process. Um, for the highest risk devices, class three and AIMDs going through application audit, um, class three devices and active implantables actually have to be entered on the uh, register uniquely, whereas many other devices can be grouped within kind, so you can um, register a bunch of different devices of the same type um, under one registration if they're low to medium risk. For the very highest risk devices, um, it is required that you go through TGA and those devices are class three devices which contain an integral medicine or a material of animal origin. Um, and for those, TGA does not um, approve based on the CE certificate, but does its own conformity assessment using processes which are essentially identical to those used in Europe. Um, the conformity assessment processes are also borrowed from the Europeans. So there's a summary of, of the current TGA regulatory process. The upshot of that is that um, for devices other than class one, in other words, devices that are subject to some kind of regulatory review, the last, vast majority um, are approved in Australia based on a CE certificate 
uh, and TGA only does a direct assessment on a relatively small proportion of high-risk devices. It is possible actually to approach TGA for conformity assessment of any class of device above um, class one. Um, that's not very commonly done. It's mainly Australian manufacturers who don't market in Europe and don't have a CE mark and don't intend to get a CE mark may go direct to TGA for any class of device. And just a quick refresher on reimbursement. Um, Australia has um, a universal public health care system um, funded through a process known as Medicare. Um, but nearly half of all Australians also have private insurance. Private insurance here um, covers a limited things. It covers hospital stays um, and a limited range of ancillaries, things like spectacles, uh, dental care. Um, it does not cover primary care. It does not cover medicines. Um, essentially, private hospital, uh, private insurance is uh, for elective procedures um, and ancillaries. So we have a mix of public and private hospital systems. Um, funding, um, to get funding, there are a number of funding schemes. The medical, medical benefits schedule, the MBS, is a list of medical procedures subsidized by Medicare. If the procedure is not on the MBS, then um, it will not be um, uh, uh, reimbursed by Medicare and it will also not be covered by private insurance. And then we have a, a process called the prosthesis list, um, which is a list of mandatory uh, reimbursement uh, fees, which must be paid by a private insurer um, for the uh, purchase of an implant in a, uh, an MBS covered procedure. So good examples are implants of uh, joint prostheses, pacemakers and so on, where um, those devices are uh, entered into the prosthesis list and uh, if an insured patient um, requires an implant of one of those devices, then the insurer is required to pay the scheduled um, prosthesis list fee. Um, uh, this means that we uh, subsidize particularly implantable devices and we subsidize processes. Um, we do not um, pay reimbursements for non-implantable devices, so devices that are not implanted are at a disadvantage. In summary, we've got a system here which is somewhat fragmented with a lot of perverse incentives. Um, there are examples where an implantable device may be used because it's reimbursed, where, where there may be a non-implantable alternative which is not reimbursed, which is uh, Favor. And all of that's under review at the moment, and we'll come back to that in a little while. There have been multiple inquiries. We're not immune to inquiries in Australia. Um, this is a list of just some of the recent inquiries into, into both regulation and reimbursement in Australia. If you look at the list, it happens sort of once a year on average. Um, there are currently uh, a couple of um, in, uh, inquiries still underway on private health insurance and medical benefits um, and the TGA is in the process of implementing its most recent inquiry which was the review of medicines and medical devices regulation otherwise known as the Sanson review um, uh, which uh, reported in 2015 and the bulk of this webinar will look at what's happening in terms of the implementation of that review and what might be happening in terms of the implementation of the current reimbursement reviews. So let's first of all just take a look at the Sanson review. Um, this was an extensive look at both medicines and medical device regulation and carried out by three experts led by um, Professor Lloyd Sampson. Um, and the stage two report in 2015 reported on medical devices and made recommendations. And really it can be summarized in, in terms of three, three broad areas. There were 32 separate recommendations, but they fell into three broad areas. The, the reviewer said we need to streamline pre-market evaluation through harmonization, uh, through seeking to leverage the activities in other jurisdictions. It said that the regulatory system needs to support innovation, and particularly small enterprises and innovative technologies. And thirdly, that the regulatory system should strengthen the post-market processes um, um, and, and shift the balance more towards post-market. And there were some very specific recommendations around there. So let's take a look at some of that. But before we do, let's just have a quick look at what's recently happened in Europe, just in one slide, um, because it really sets this all in context. In Europe, um, anybody who's uh, not been completely asleep will realize there's been major changes um, 
the implementation of the medical device regulation. And those changes fall into two categories. Um, really what I call governance. Uh, in Europe, the, uh, the arrangements have been changed to strengthen the capabilities of notified bodies to pr produce fewer but stronger notified bodies with stronger criteria and, and, and process for designation of the notified bodies, more centralized oversight, and importantly, uh, the introduction of unannounced inspections. Um, and there are stricter rules on authorized representatives, requirements for greater um, in-house competence and direct liability for product. Separately, the actual regulatory requirements themselves have been strengthened, um, particularly uh, much stronger requirements for clinical evidence, where clinical trials are now effectively um, the default for class three devices and for active implantables and uh, a, an overhaul of the device classification system to reflect um, the learnings of the last uh, 15, 20 years or so of, of running uh, the European system. So a bunch of new devices have been, up, uh, for example, pushed up into class three, and there have been some uh, adjustments to the system um, to reflect, uh, to, to iron out some obvious um, uh, outliers and uh, addition of requirements for software. So that's what's happened in Europe. And the Sansom review was happening while the European uh, regulations were being hammered out uh, through the, the, uh, the trilogue process in Europe at the same time. Um, and what was going on in Europe for sure had a, an influence as to what happened here in Australia and, uh, um, uh, and uh, affected uh, input to that review. And uh, some of the outcomes of the review are really reflected uh, in the context of the large changes in Europe, given that Australia relies on Europe for the bulk of its device approvals at the moment by recognizing CE certificates. TGA has an um, extensive set of clinical um, evidence requirements. Um, but let's just look at uh, the 32 recommendations, which really break down to a, to a smaller group. Um, firstly, um, the reviewer said, don't change the system. So like in Europe, the, the basic model of a risk-based classification, uh, essential principles, standards for compliance, and risk-based assessment are the same. Um, the reviewers called for a clear rationale for any unique requirements in Australia. Really, that was saying, let's get rid of all these little differences that still exist. We have some small differences in classification, which are frankly administratively troublesome both for the regulator and the industry and um, that they shouldn't exist. Um, we need to uh, streamline uh, uh, the low risk devices, reduce the activity on class one and really that's already in place because TJ has a simple notification scheme um, and introduce an expedited pathway to support new technologies and TGA is looking to do the same as is already done in other markets such as China and the US with their ex expedited pathways. The really big one is around expanding access to different review pathways through third parties and through leveraging um, other international approvals not just the CE. Um, so that's going to be uh, the big change and TJ is looking at ways of doing that. And finally, a stronger post-market um, um, through use of registries and the international sharing of data. Um, so let's just take a look at the multiple paths for review. Um, firstly, you can still be assessed by TGA and um, it's possible for any manufacturer to go direct to TJ for any device. Um, um, but uh, you, what is also being contemplated is um, that uh, assessment may be done by third parties which are designated specifically in Australia. Um, how that's going to be done yet remains to be seen, but it's uh, a bit like a notified body in Europe um, or um, the registrar systems that exist in Canada and in Japan. Uh, the big question is um, how many notified bodies will the market support? Um, and really, um, there's a whole separate discussion about who should be uh, appointed or designated as third party notified, uh, third party assessors in Australia. Really, you want to use the same bodies that are acting uh, in international markets. Um, we already uh, do most of our uh, reviews, as I said, based on an international third party, such as notified body. Um, the bulk of um, medium to low risk devices are um, approved in Australia based on a CE certificate. 
Um, but the interesting one is maybe using other comparable overseas authorities as a basis for review. So how would TJ, for example, leverage a review in Canada, Europe, uh, in the US or in say Japan? Um, Separately, the new technologies, uh, particular changes around that were about both pre-market and post-market. So it said, let's get this expedited pathway up for assessment of novel technology, um, where interestingly, uh, the reviewers contemplated a, um, a more streamlined approach to clinical evidence where there may be post-market follow-up for promising novel technologies. That's a contentious issue because um, I don't think anybody wishes to lower the regulatory bar. Um, and secondly, in the post-market space, uh, a strong statement that high-risk implantables should all be included in registries and the TGA should be responsible for the correct operation of those registries. Currently, there's really only one very large registry operating in Australia, which is the Joint Replacement Registry, run not by TGA, but by the clinicians, by the Orthopaedic Association, although there's a great deal of dialogue between TGA and that association. and and TGA takes a strong interest in the uh, findings of the registry and particularly the identification of devices with higher than anticipated revision rates where TGA actively follows that up. It's been a busy time over the last year for consultations. These are just some of the consultations. There are a few more still ongoing um, where TGA is now looking at how it might implement some of the recommendations of the review. And we'll just look at what's already happened. So these are some of the uh, changes that have taken place across the whole agency. These are not specific to particular therapeutic areas. TGA um, has introduced a thing called SME Assist, which is a largely online program of providing additional information and support for small company applicants and R&D groups who are developing medicines and devices. Um, and you can see a separate page on the website now with a lot of basic information for parties who um, may need to approach regulation but have not had any prior experience of doing so. Um, special access has been extended to allow uh, a notification system for devices with well-established histories of safe use rather than needing specific um, pre-approval. Um, Post market in the back office, post market event reporting um, is being supported through better data analytics to look at what's coming into the device and medicines adverse event reporting databases to see if the, to do better trend monitoring. And TGA has streamlined its committee processes, so there's now one expert advisory committee in each therapeutic area. So these are sort of bread and butter reforms. Um, there are another, a number of other administrative reforms going through, such as a recent change to, um, to write special conditions of registration, um, which used to be entered onto each individual certificate, um, to update the language on those and write it straight into regulation. So now all uh, entries have the same standard conditions of inclusion on the register and those conditions specify things like post-market reporting requirements, times for responses to requests for information and so on, and really provide a stable and common platform for all entries in the register for TGA to then build on a, a more effective post-market um, monitoring and enforcement program. Um, these are some of the planned reforms yet to come through. Um, TJ is bringing back in-house um, the control of advertising. It was currently uh, managed on behalf of TGA by an external group. It's now be, going to be brought back in-house, um, simplified removal of pre-approval processes um, and uh, supported by much stronger enforcement powers. Um, TJ is um, updating its enforcement powers across the board, but with uh, particular um, uh, aspects uh, dealing with advertising, uh, there'll be a much more graduated uh, level of, uh, uh, scheme of, of enforcement powers, starting with civil penalties and infringement notices all the way up to um, uh, criminal actions and tough penalties for aggravated criminal conduct. Um, and finally, um, special access is going to be moved online um, with web-based filing for all special access requests. That's across the board. Let's just have a quick look at what's going on in medicines. Um, uh, the, the TJ's already implemented a number of reforms around um, uh, notification systems for minor variations for both over-the-counter and prescription me registered medicines, um, updating the catalog of permissible ingredients, um, looking at uh, improving its review and appeal rights in the area of complementary medicines and, and new ingredients. Um, and looking at, uh, and has implemented already a priority review pathway for what it calls vital and life-saving prescription medicines. 
planned. Um, there's um, going back to um, leveraging international uh, uh, reviews for prescription medicines, um, looking at enhancing the pharmacovigilance programs, and um, a provisional approval pathway for promising promising uh, new medicines which still having a complete clinical dossier but have a potentially substantial clinical benefit so looking at again moving towards uh, a, a phased approval with post-market follow-up in the medical device spaces what's been implemented well not a lot yet um, the, the agency is uh, still planning some of the uh, medical device reviews but here's what's uh, already been talked about and has been consulted um, a similar expedited approval pathway for novel devices this has already been implemented for medicines um, how to designate third-party conformity assessors and again the question is um, how many and will they come um, uh, leveraging overseas approvals from comparable regulators um, is actively under consideration. I'd like to just come back to that in a moment. And reharmonization um, with the European uh, medical device regulations. With all of those changes I've said before that are going on in Europe, um, how does TJ adapt to that and bring the system in line and really take the opportunity to really closely align with Europe and get rid of some of those um, awkward um, minor differences which cause so much administrative headache. So let's just look at reharmonization. Um, what's required? Well, classification needs to be brought back into line. Europeans have changed their classifications and upgraded a bunch of uh, devices into class three. And really that just is a matter of changing the Australian classification system and bringing it back into line. And that's already underway. The first consultations have occurred and probably the first change will be the up classification to class three of um, surgical meshes. Um, that's been done already in Europe in the MDR and TGA is well advanced in doing the same thing here. Um, with clinical evidence, um, TGA I think is already there and now closely aligned with Europe. Europeans have actually in effect caught up with what was already the case in, in, in Australia. Um, and aligning the essential principles or requirements, we have different language for the same effect. Uh, there's a strong case for um, perhaps adopting the European language. But what about leveraging overseas approvals? Australia already heavily relies upon Europe um, with the vast majority of devices which require TGA review are approved based on CE certification, not by direct TGA conformity assessment. At most, there is an application audit for the higher risk devices, which looks at the uh, high level reports on clinical evaluation and risk assessment and the like. But what's likely to be the demand for use of other approvals? Given this um, high use of CE, the question really is how many devices may have, for example, a US approval or a Canadian approval, but not have a CE? Because those would be the ones which might use the alternate pathway. They do exist, um, but how many of them are there? Um, thirdly, um, despite rumours to the contrary, Australians do actually speak English um, and uh, perhaps this limits the options to the uh, English speaking major jurisdictions at the moment, particularly Canada, the USA and Europe. Um, it's going to be much more difficult for TGA to leverage, um, for example, approvals from Japan where the, all of the documentation is in Japanese. Um, now, it's fairly straightforward to see how TGA may leverage Canadian approvals because like Europe, they use a very system, a very similar system of, of assessment and similar classification, similar means of approval. The Canadian system is also based around the European model. So it wouldn't be too much of a stretch for TGA to start leveraging Canadian approvals and certifications. And in fact, they already do so in uh, for certain in vitro diagnostics and have been doing so for some time. But what about the United States FDA? And the argument is, well, it's a very different uh, system of regulation with a fundamentally different base in, in, in that the, uh, the bulk of devices in America are approved using the 510K process based on demonstration of substantial equivalence with already marketed devices. But let's just take a look at what goes on in the 510K. This is the contents list of a 510K submission. Um, on the left, in yellow, uh, is all the administrative information, the cover sheet and the, um, the, the cover letter and all the rest of it. Uh, I don't want to um, look at that. But what is interesting is the information on the right. So these are the standard chapters, um, and there are 20 different sections in a 510K. And this group in, in uh, red on the right 
talk, uh, set out the requirements that go into every 510k submission. So um, design information, device description, intended use, risk assessment needs to be summarized and the FDA has increasingly required more detail in summary of risk assessment in recent times. Um, a substantial equivalence discussion, which really is a US way of looking at things. Um, but having said that, the, the clinical evidence requirements these days um, in, incorporate within them the, the expectation that you will look at a predicate or a, uh, or a similar device and compare your device to, to, to the performance of devices already on the market. So the substantial equivalence concept is now well and truly embedded in both Australian and, for example, European medical device regulation. Labeling and then technical chapters on sterilization, on biocompatibility, on software, on electrical safety and EMC, and on performance testing, whether it be bench testing, uh, preclinical or clinical. The, my point is that these chapters present in a 510k really address all of the essential principles. These things are covered in the essential principles, biocompatibility essential principle seven, um, electromagnetic compatibility essential principle 12 and so on. So maybe it's not as difficult as it would seem because underneath, although we have this idea of substantial equivalence, the actual submission dossier that goes to the, to the US FDA is not that different from what's in a European technical file or an Australian technical file. So let's just take a look at where we might be in say five years from now. This is uh, speculation. It's not fact, it's just um, musing of what might happen. Um, given the reform program, given the changes in Europe, given what's been recommended and what TJ has already consulted on. Um, I would expect, and uh, certainly the agency with all of the pronouncements is, is looking to, to um, realign with the changes into the medical device regulations and will probably do so over the same sort of time frame. So the classifications come back into line, assessment procedures still remain the same, and we don't have any significant technical differences between regulation in Europe and the regulation in Australia. There will be much wider assessment options. Still, I, I would imagine um, the bulk of devices will, will leverage CE, but there will be other options through third parties in Australia, through um, other international approvals being um, used as the basis for an Australian decision, and uh, leveraging the MDSAP uh, program where um, TGA may um, use the MDSAP uh, program to provide additional support um, for bridge reviews here. Um, this means that TGA is probably going to back out of most direct device reviews and really focus its attention on the areas where it still requires mandatory TGA conformity assessment at the moment, that is those class 3 devices uh, with a medicine or a biologic. Um, and the mutual recognition agreement is probably going to die on the vine. It's not really used very much at the moment. And um, given the, uh, the strengthening of notified body requirements in Europe, it doesn't seem to be worthwhile for TGA to seek to be redesignated as a notified body under the new arrangements. Certainly, there's going to be stronger post-market regulation. We're seeing the administrative basis of that being put in place. We're seeing TGA stepping up its post-market audit requirements uh, activities already. Um, it's not just going to be about adverse event reporting. I suspect the agency is going to be much more active, and we are going to see much uh, a, a gradual imp uh, increase in cooperation with registries. And then in 2022, at the end of the IVD, um, uh, transition in, in Europe, I would expect that TGA will start to accept um, CE certificates to support IVD approvals, which is problematic at the moment because the, um, most IVDs are not subject to pre-market review in Europe, whereas most are in Australia. But let's just now turn our um, attention briefly to reimbursement. And I can say simply that currently it's all under negotiation and investigation. Those reviews are still on foot. Um, there have been some hints of some of the changes that might take place, but nothing is settled yet. Let's just take a look at what's really going on uh, through a couple of examples. This is the Prosthesis Industry Working Group, which um, uh, got together a government industry working group and uh, produced an outcome statement on uh, the reviews that are going on on the, on the uh, private health insurance um, framework it's pointed out there is a lack of transparency in the current system. Everybody agreed that there was a scope for some benefit reductions for some categories in the prosthesis list. Some of the reimbursements are, are very generous and um, we've seen some, some of that take place. I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, 
but at the same time there was a recognition that the costs of clinical support shipping and provision of instruments is is is, is significant um, and that needs to be factored into the reimbursement payments most importantly i think is that the definition of a prosthesis needs to be much more flexible at the moment only fully implanted devices permanently implanted devices are eligible for prosthesis list reimbursement and we need to look at that again because it's shutting out um, new technologies which are not implantable which are but which are currently not eligible for reimbursement and um, finally uh, the the prosthesis list should really not be um, taking into account safety in its reimbursement decisions because after all that is the prerogative TGA and uh, simply uh, you need a TGA approval before you can get a reimbursement um, uh, listing um, so there shouldn't be any need for an additional safety review which has been happening in the past. Um, there have been some price reductions already negotiated with, in, with industry. This happened earlier this year, um, where um, these devices um, saw these uh, reductions between 7.5% and 10% in the scheduled um, uh, uh, reimbursement amounts for interocular lenses, um, both posterior and anterior um, cardiac devices, hip prostheses and knee prostheses were all reduced in the reimbursement payments. Um, there's further reform planned. Um, the, there's a current review of the prosthesis list criteria underway. Um, this seems to be good news for suppliers of innovative technology. There is really active consideration of expanding the definition of what might be eligible for such reimbursement um, uh, and maybe moving away from the permanent implant um, absolute requirement um, and may uh, allow some innovative, less invasive technology to be reimbursed. So uh, that's where I'm going to stop. That's a bit of a skate through the reform process. As you can see, there's a lot going on and not much of it is settled yet. Um, what I'm now going to do is see if we can move to some questions and answers. Okay, so I have a set of questions here. Firstly, from Stuart. Um, Stuart says, um, can you just go back about the mutual recognition agreement? Um, what about the MRA? Um, yes, so uh, the mutual recognition agreement is a, is a treaty agreement between Australia and the European Union actually covers a whole range of industry sectors about cooperation on regulation. And the MRA, um, in its simplest form, allows the Therapeutic Goods Administration, TGA, to act effectively as a notified body to provide approvals, CE certification for Australian manufacturers to access the European market. And it also uh, allows the participating notified bodies in the MRA scheme, not all notified bodies participate, allows the participating uh, notified bodies to effectively stand in the shoes of the TGA and conduct assessments to Australian requirements and issue TGA conformity assessment certificates for access to the Australian market. Really, um, it was only ever useful on the inbound to Australia side, it was only ever useful uh, for manufacturers of higher uh, risk devices to um, have their notified body issue the TGA conformity assessment, assessment certificate and therefore effectively avoid the application audit process and to go straight to market in Australia without an additional local review. However, in the most recent change of the MRA, um, TGA explicitly um, blocked that pathway by requiring confidence building measures before it would accept MRA certifications for those higher risk devices. So effectively inbound to Australia, the mutual recognition agreement has been ineffective for some time. Um, on the outbound side, um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't believe the TGA is likely to pursue redesignation, um, although in theory the treaty still stands. Um, there are not that many local manufacturers that, that get their CE mark through TGA and most of them seem to be moving, uh, transitioning to notified bodies. So my expectation is the MRA is, is going to um, gradually wither away. Um, I have a question from Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. Is there a possibility that e-labeling will be included in few med future medical device reforms? Um, yes, uh, TGA already uh, effectively accepts e-labeling. Um, uh, in, in certain formats. The whole question of um, things like UDI um, and use of the GMDNS codes in, in uh, device uh, registration and so on was subject to active review a couple of years ago, but TJ backed away from it as the uh, IMDRF introduced the UDI program and took the decision to step back from those reforms and to let the UDI uh, system mature internationally uh, 
rather than uh, TGA going its own way and then ending up with a different approach. So in, in rough answer to your question, yes, e-labeling is already allowed. Um, uh, there is still a requirement to provide um, hard copy labeling in, uh, if, if requested in a similar way it is in other jurisdictions. Um, uh, and uh, the UDI program uh, uh, will eventually be implemented in Australia, but not just yet. Um, Matt asks, um, what about dental technologies? Any effects on dental technologies? Um, I don't believe so because dental uh, devices are really um, largely unaffected by the changes in Europe and are likely to be unaffected here. That They will continue to be regulated in the same way. In With perhaps one interesting exception, um, there's been a very active consideration by TGA recently of its um, regulation of custom devices. There was a, a workshop held between TGA and the industry uh, a few weeks ago now in Melbourne uh, where um, industry participants were asked to meet with TGA and consult on what are the risks with custom devices uh, and, and what changes should happen. The TGA custom device framework really is a notification scheme only. It was written and, uh, and derived in the days when custom devices meant dental crowns and spectacle lenses um, and now custom devices includes things like um, uh, spinal implants, uh, much higher risk. Um, so uh, what was interesting in that debate, uh, which I participated in, is that uh, clearly there's a need to step up the regulation of effectively mass-produced custom devices where there are co with a commercial scale production of high-risk implantable custom devices. Um, in the US, in Canada, in Europe, uh, under the recent changes in the European regulations, all of those are subject to full conformity assessment or regulatory review in the same way that um, off-the-shelf devices are in Australia. That's not the case and I think there was consensus that that needs to change. Um, but there was also quite a clear recognition by the, that uh, consultation group and by the TGA that dental devices um, are a little different, that by and large they are lower risk, um, crown and bridge work orthodontic devices and so on are lower risk, um, largely class 2A devices and maybe there are grounds for leaving those under the current custom device arrangements, although dental implants are likely to be, um, if they are custom made, are likely to um, uh, be captured in, in reforms of the custom made um, process. So that's about what's happening with, with dental devices. Um, TGA requirements for software. Nicholas asks, can we speak a little on TGA requirements for software, including mobile app technical and validation requirements? Um, so TJ has consulted on the software as a medical device guidance from the IMDRF. Um, TJ is really um, actively looking at um, picking that up. Uh, TJ will, I am sure, uh, modify its classification scheme and, and the essential principles to pick up the changes that have happened in Europe. Um, but I've long been of the view that um, medical device, providing um, it is clear that medical device standalone software is a medical device um, when it's used for a clinical or a diagnostic purpose or to control another medical device, that there are existing regulatory requirements which can be effectively applied to software. Um, and so I don't believe there's that much need for regulatory change there. But um, you specifically ask about technical and validation requirements, uh, including mobile apps. I think TGA takes the same approach as, as is taken in other jurisdictions, um, applying uh, medical device software lifecycle controls, IEC 62304, um, and requiring validation of the software in the same way as any other medical device software, not requiring validation of the, um, the hardware independently, um, but simply validating the software run on the platforms for which it is designed. So if you've got a, an, an iPhone app, um, you need to validate the use of that software when run on an iPhone uh, or run on an Android device if it's a, if it's a Google app, for example. Um, just checking for more questions. I'll take one more. Um, I have a question. Um, from Vivian who says, what's the timeline for TGA change of classifications? Well, um, 
TJ has already actively con uh, consulted on the up classification of surgical meshes. Um, that's going to go forward um, probably first, and then I would expect the TGA will seek to um, change its classification um, rules to bring it more into line with the with the new MDR rules in Europe. My view is it's likely that whatever time these new rules are implemented, um, I would expect transitional arrangements, which um, would most logically be uh, put in place to align with the European transitions. In other words, it doesn't make sense for Australia to change its classification rules and to require those to be implemented before the Europeans have reached the end of their transition. So there needs to be some flexibility about, about transitioning to the new rules um, in line with the schedule in Europe. Okay, I think um, we'll stop at that point. Um, I uh, just want to now um, say thank you for your attendance. Um, uh, we've had a fairly large audience with this, and uh, I do appreciate your forbearance on an unfortunate technical glitch in the middle of it all. Um, uh, we will uh, be pulling together recordings suitably edited, um, making that available on our website, and you'll all get an email um, with a link to the video and a link to, the, to a copy of the slides. Um, if you uh, uh, have found this webinar useful, um, please do uh, uh, visit our website, look at the uh, the other webinars that are present there. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, um, follow us on LinkedIn, um, and look at our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, we hope uh, to um, see you again next month for our next uh, live webinar. Uh, thank you for your attendance, and uh, good morning to you all. <laughs>